Adam fam. Uh, something unique happened this weekend that's literally never happened uh, before in the history of our church of going online. Uh, everything recorded, everything went live except for uh, the sermon audio. Like the video was there crystal clear. The audio just blinked. I don't know why this happened. Our team uh, just kind of did a deep dive after service, figuring out what went wrong. And uh, we, we have no idea. Everything was right. <laughs> Everything should have been right. Um, but the team really encouraged me. Uh, this message is really helpful and really encouraging, convicting yet encouraging. And so I wanted to make sure you get this message. So you're getting a little bit of a different format from me today. Uh, we've been in this series called The Way uh, for, for three weeks. This is our fourth part in The Way. And, um, and, and so I'm excited to dive into to this message. We're going to turn to Mark chapter 8. Verses 31 through 33, uh, the text says this, uh, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders, by the chief priests and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. Verse 32, he spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, um, he said, uh, he rebuked Peter, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, or the concerns of God, but the things of men. you got an earthly mindset, not an eternal mindset. I imagine if we were in that scene right there, hanging out with the rest of the disciples, you would probably be thinking what I was thinking you done messed up, Pedro. This is this is a miss, man. You think you had it figured out, and then you opened your big <laughs> mouth and got rebuked by Jesus. Uh, for uh, throughout the series, I've been teaching and, and been prompting us not only as Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, but as his followers, as his disciples, as students, we are called to be in the way of Jesus. We are to follow in the way of Jesus, and yet so many times. I think this text comes to us as a great warning of what can happen in our lives that we're called to be following in the way of Jesus, but sometimes we're in the way of Jesus. And it's not Peter that Jesus is like, hey, get behind me. You're in the way. Your mind is set on earthly things, not eternal things. Sometimes that's not Peter. That is us. And sometimes we open our big mouth and, and we think we've got it figured out and we've got it so uh, wrong. Have you ever found yourself in a situation in which uh, you think you're being helpful and you're actually not being helpful? This happens to us regularly in the kitchen uh, because I had four years of culinary experience in high school. I, that, that means I took home ec when that was a thing. I don't even know if that's a thing anymore. But I took four years of culinary class, mainly for the girls and the cookies, no lie. Uh, we made chocolate chip cookies and snickerdoodle cookies and sold those to our school. And so, um, but yeah, I, I was in that. I really thought I wanted to, to go to, to uh, be in the CIA, uh, not the Central Intelligence Agency, but the Culinary Institute of America. I thought I wanted that. Uh, and then I started working in a restaurant and I realized uh, I don't like making food. I like eating food. <laughs> and so uh, thus Taryn has been our chef in our house uh, for the past 15, 16 years. And uh, sometimes uh, she's making an amazing meal in there and I uh, want to be a good husband. I jump in there thinking I'm going to be helpful. And sometimes I am helpful and more times than not, I'm, uh, I'm just in the way. And she'll give me a, a harsh look or a little huff of the breath and uh, essentially say, get behind me, say, and in her own <laughs> nonverbal communication words to me. And I realize I can be in the way. Maybe you found this in your life. Well, here Jesus is prophesying to his disciples of how things are about to go down. Verse 32 says, this isn't a parable anymore. Jesus is saying plainly, this is how it's going to happen. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be killed. And I'm going to rise again on the third day. And I'm guessing, I don't know this, but it seems like Peter trailed off after the I'm going to be killed part and just missed the whole rise again part. He was like, locked into his own thought and and we, we just had a, recently had a, a, a mayoral I say it mayoral a, a mayor's contest um, and, and uh, here in, in in Jacksonville and just for a second imagine yourself in the inner circle of one of those candidates right and they're going for office you know they're getting ready to 
to kind of step in on, onto the forefront of, uh, of their leadership. And they tell you they're going to be rejected and betrayed and killed. You would immediately probably do what Peter um, did, which is, there's no way. You would just become an encourager in the moment that there's no way that that's right. We're not going to let that happen. Maybe we found ourselves in that. But Jesus is prophesying something very real that is going to take place. And he says, must happen. That he must suffer. And for many of us as Christians, we don't want suffering to be a part of our journey. We don't want pain to be a part of, of the reality of our, our broken and fallen world. And Jesus is, a, is around salvation. It is the, 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 the salvation of uh, mankind hangs in the balance. And Jesus was resolute about the reality of suffering in his life. Um, and, and we must realize that it's, it, it's going to be part of our journey in some way, shape, or form as well. Um, but he, here, here's the truth that I, I want to uh, help you lean into for a moment. Is that the thoughts of God and the ways of God are, are, are so much higher and so much different than the thoughts and ways of man. So much different. And if we're really honest with ourselves in this moment, we tend to equate our thoughts as being very close to God's thoughts. N not in word. We would never tell anybody, yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty close to thinking like God. But when we read the word of God and, and we hear a word that's convicting or, 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 or something in the text that, that, man, I don't like that. I don't like that command of God. I don't like that righteous requirement for us. I don't like that idea of holiness. I don't like that I have to change my mind on how I think about sexuality or finance, stewarding my finances or whatever it might be. I don't like that. Uh, um, immediately what's happened is our thoughts are really close to God's in our own self. And Isaiah the prophet, God speaks through him to uh, remind us of this reality. Uh, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I.e., for example, what he's saying here is there is a big difference between God's thoughts and our thoughts, and yet we equate them so close to one another on a daily basis. In practical moments of our life, it's not even close. As far as the heavens are to the earth, that's the difference between our thoughts and our ways and God's ways. And so we, we around here, we say our fourth core value is divine vision. And this is not like a place we arrive at now. We see perfectly in every situation. It is a pursuit of our life to say, God, how do you see this situation? What does your word say about this? And, and it's a hopeful expectation that whether we see that perfectly or imperfectly, God is going to turn it for good. And God is working all things for, for the good. And God's not finished yet. In any situation, in any moment, in any person's life, how does God see this? How is God bringing this to his ultimate and what does he want to do in this situation? But many times we think we know better. Story of my life back, to, uh, maybe you can think back to when you were in high school, maybe looking out to the great wild blue of your future and just had great dreams and plans for the future. And like, how did that work out <laughs> for you? Probably like it worked out for me. I had this great plan, right? I was going to go to school and, <clears throat> and, uh, pursue music business degree and get a master's in business administration and MBA. And I was going on and be a music executive. That's what I thought I, I wanted. I had a great plan for it. So I started off on that journey at 18 years old, um, started a music business degree, met my beautiful wife that semester and just fell deeply in love. And um, uh, after that, like I began to just feel unsettled that something was wrong in this um, and, and just constrained in my heart that I don't know where I'm going, This, but this is not it. W whatever I had planned for the future is not God's plans uh, is what I can say in hindsight. But at that moment, it just felt like pain. It felt like being totally lost. I didn't know what was happening. Um, and, and I just cried out to God, God, would you direct my steps? Would you lead me? Uh, whatever, you, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And he did that and told me to change my major to a pastoral ministry um, degree and a music minor, and, and I did that the next day, and, and the rest is history. All that to say, I had a good plan, how I thought it was supposed to be, and how I wanted it to be, and God had a better plan, 
a, a, a better uh, way. And here's the reality. Uh, death and resurrection, death and suffering and, and, and rejection is not how we would draw it up. And yet God's plan included those things. And so let the life, death, and resurrection encourage you in a few ways. One, let it encourage you that what looks and feels like death and defeat right now will ultimately end um, in victory. Either in this age or in the age to come, uh, what, what feels like suffering now, God will bring to an ultimate end in victory in His kingdom. Uh, it should also encourage us that being faithful to God's plan does not um, uh, mean that hardship and suffering is not going to be a part of our life. It, it can be, and at times it, it will be very real to us. But take hope, Jesus suffered and endured so that there is that ultimate victory in the end. And, we, and so therefore we have great hope in the midst of it because it encourages us that God's faithful. And God did show up uh, in the life of Jesus. He, he rose again on the third days, and that gives us great hope for our own uh, resurrection uh, at the last day. You know, Jesus is speaking plainly now, and, and I believe God wants to speak plainly to us too. Because see, Peter had it all set in his mind. He, he, he had it very clear that this was not okay, and he had good intentions. His intent was love, and yet he unknowingly was used of Satan. I think that cautions us that you don't have to be demon-possessed uh, to be used of Satan, to be getting in the way of God. Uh, years ago, I uh, really at the beginning of, of Fathom, I felt the Lord prompting me to be involved in our worship ministry, and, and I kept saying no. I kept saying no. I was convinced that that was not the best thing. I was just kind of rejecting this word um, for God. I was convinced in my own mind that, you know, that, that was not what was best, and and so I only led worship three or four times in the life of our church. But, um, but then at times I was frustrated about kind of the culture of worship and, and the quality of, of our music and things like that. Well, there's this couple that was really kind of getting plugged in and really growing in their faith. And, and uh, I remember they, they, they left our church. And I, I began to just question, God, what happened there? And, and I, so I just reached out to the husband and I said, hey, man, missing you guys. What's um, you know, is everything okay? And he said, honestly, here's what's going on. For a while, uh, we just haven't been able to connect with the, the worship of the church. And that's, that's a big part of our life. And, and, and the part of the gathering of the body, honestly, we could not understand what the worship leaders were saying. My heart just broke. And as soon as I, I got off the call with, with, with this guy or text, whatever it was, as soon as that, that moment was over, I just felt like the Lord just said, hey, your disobedience is costing people spiritually. And that's really just to say to us, just because we're convinced in our own mind does not make us right. You can think about all these phrases in our, in our society in which we're convinced that we're saying it right. Like one for me for a long time was, uh, I would call it an old wives tale. An old, uh, uh, an old wives tale. I call it an old wives tale. And actually the saying is old wives tale. So my family relentlessly ridiculed me for a weekend and they still haven't let it go like just let it go people um but maybe there's a, a phrase or a saying like that in your life maybe it's something much deeper that you're convinced that you're in the right but our lives are not lining up to the word of god and i think we really need to to take the words of paul in romans chapter 12 verse 2 which he says don't be conformed anymore to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We can be convinced in our own mind and that most of that is developed out of these patterns of the world, these ways of thinking like Peter that are earthly, that we know best and we can become convinced in our own mind and yet still be absolutely wrong. And, and sometimes that wrong means we're actually in the way of what God's trying to do in his kingdom, in our life, in those around us. Um, uh, uh, or, or in our own journey and, and how he wants to use us. But we can be in the way. And there's a thousand different ways that we can be in the way. We can be in the way by kind of a false sense of humility. We can be in the way because of just our absolute disobedience. We can be in the way because of our greed. We can be in the way um, because of jealousy or bitterness um, or, or just uh, kind of arrogant saying, no, no, I'm just not going to do that. Refusal to obey God. 
There's so many ways that we can be in the way, but we're called to be in the way and fall in the way of Jesus. And the only way that happens is by, by a changing of our mind. To say, no, 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 God, you're right. Your ways, your thoughts are higher than mine. What do you say about my finances? What do you say about my marriage? Who I'm supposed to be as a husband or a wife or a mother or a father? Who who am I supposed to be in my calling, God? What are, what are you leading me in? My sexuality, maybe, that you feel confused with. Yes, what, what am I supposed to be? God, who have you called me to be? And that changes everything. Some of us, we've been caught in a pattern in our mind that just reflects out of the world. And we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And some of us have not. We refuse to be renewed in our mind. But what Paul goes on to say, then, after renewed mind, then we can test and approve what God's will is, good, pleasing, and perfect will. You say, hey, how do I know? How do I have divine vision? How do I know? Well, we, we gotta have a we gotta have a, a, a transformed mind, not a conformed mind. But the reality in so many of our lives is we've got a conformed mind. It's the pattern of this world. And so how are we transformed by the renewing of our mind? Three quick things. One, we've got to know the Word of God. Psalm 119, verse 11 says, uh, I, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I've hidden it in your heart. That's not chapter and verse. That's not holy. What's holy, what's sacred is it's hidden away in our heart. We have to know the Word of God. We can't be opposed to How How can we know what God's will is if we don't know the truth of His Word, that He has spoken, that this is God breathed for us, and it's good. And so we need to befriend pruning and correction that comes through his word, whether through a teaching such as this, or, or just our own time with God's spirit, opening up the word and letting him speak to us. We need to befriend correction and pruning so that we can discern what God's perfect will is. We need to become true disciples, true students of Jesus. God, what do you say? I want to follow you. Because once we know his word, the second thing is then we can filter everything through the lens of God's word. That means every commercial, every movie, every kind of saying of the culture about, you know, about what we're supposed to be and who we're supposed to be in our culture. There's so many things that we need to filter out these messages from all these Instagram voices and YouTube voices and all these different pastors you may be listening to. We need to filter everything through the Word of God, but we can't do that unless we know the Word of God. Jesus himself, in, in Matthew chapter 4, when he is being tempted by uh, Satan himself, uh, we actually see the, the language, the wording that Jesus used to Peter in, in Mark chapter 8 is very similar to what Jesus says to Satan himself in his temptation before the launching of his ministry, just as we'll talk about the context in a moment, for Peter is the launching of their ministry just on the horizon. Well, Satan is tempting Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. Tell these stones to become bread. Your hungry is fasted 40 days. And Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Father. Whenever you see the words, it is written, Jesus is saying, I'm building this upon the word of God. My, I, I'm not speaking of my own accord. I'm speaking of God. He goes on a second time. It is written. The third time he tempts him. It is written. But actually in that one, he says, um, get, you know, away from me, Satan. Kind of another, get behind me, Satan. Away from me, Satan. It is written three times. So Jesus is fil Jesus himself is filtering everything through the word of God. But if we don't have it hidden in our heart, we can't speak that back to Satan, to those lies that are, eat you know, rising up within us. Third thing, so know the word of God. Filter everything through the word of God. And thirdly, we've got to actually trust the word of God. Jesus is telling Peter and his own emotions, his own desires are getting in the way to, to what really Jesus is saying plainly right now. This is what's going to happen. And so we actually need to trust his word, a powerful passage of scripture on trusting his word. And what really needs to happen in us comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. I want to read those to you. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Strongholds are patterns of sin, are patterns of thinking, right? Don't be conformed. Right? Patterns of thinking um, that, that we begin to live in. Patterns of sin that we that just become a part of us so much so that we can't, it becomes to have a stronghold on our lives. 
uh, the, the next verse says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. We destroy the arguments, right? We have divine power. We have power. It's not a weapon of this world. It's not flesh. It's not my physical. It's a spiritual authority that God has given us to tear to up uh, and destroy those strongholds. And what do we do? We destroy the arguments and the lofty opinion that's raised against the knowledge of God. Uh, many of us, we spend a lot of time destroying the arguments on the outside and not enough time uh, bringing the lofty opinions on the inside, bringing those down and destroying those. And I would just say, hey, you got to destroy the lofty opinions and arguments inside before getting too focused on the arguments outside. And God may give us an opportunity to speak into those, um, uh, but we've got to do what the rest of the verse says, which is take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. So one, know the word of God, hide it in our heart. Two, begin to filter everything through that. And then we've got to actually obey. We've got to take every thought captive, bring every opinion from without or within, filter it, and then be obedient and trust God in his word. Uh, Peter um, you know, has to be humbled by this great statement, get uh, behind me, uh, Satan. And Jesus, we have to just be uh, amazed at his resoluteness about the reality of his physical death. We talked about that in part one of the series, the need for Jesus' physical death uh, as a once and for all sacrifice for sin. We needed that. And likewise, Jesus will go on to tell us here and tell his disciples, us as his disciples, that Jesus needed a physical death, and we we have to, to learn to live a spiritual death, not only in the moment of salvation, but ongoing to follow him. Here's what Jesus says. If anyone wants to come after me, this is the next verse, verse 34 in Mark chapter 8. If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He who wants to save his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake in the gospel's will save it. So if you if you try to hang on and say, no, I've got my opinion, you're, you're going to lose it anyway. <laughs> Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And there's so many in our world right now, so many Christians who are like, yeah, I, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, but they're unwilling to deny themselves because they've got this pattern of thinking of the world. Just like filter that one verse through the word of God and what Jesus is saying here with our society. What is the messaging? What's the pattern of thinking in our world earthly concerns that we have, right? It's not deny yourself, it's treat yourself, right? You gotta say yourself, that's how it's said. Treat yourself. It, it, it's not take up your cross and follow me, it's, it's you, know, um, you know, live your best life as you follow your heart, be who you ever, whoever you wanna be. It's so different from deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, but that's the reality of what it means to follow. Jesus. For some in, in, in our, of our Christians, brothers and sisters, it's not just going to be a spiritual death. It's that, that death will actually end in physical death and martyrdom. That's a part of our Christian history and, and a part of the reality of our Christian future. Uh, for many of our brothers and sisters, for Peter, if we begin to zoom out on his life and just for a second, just get a little context for this moment in Mark chapter 8. This happens just on the heels. This get behind me, Satan. Your mind is set on earthly things and not eternal things, on the things of man, not the things of God. This message comes right on the heels of Jesus saying, hey, here's the keys to the kingdom of God. Uh, on this rock, I'll build my church. We see that in the Gospel of Matthew. He says this on the heels of the, or right before this. Uh, here's the keys to the kingdom. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to you. Right, good. You're going to lead my church, Peter. Then what happens? The next breath, the next moment, Get behind me, Satan. And doesn't that warn us how quickly we can go from, man, power and authority to, man, we're actually in the way. <laughs> Just that quick it can happen. Well, look on the other side of the context. After this moment of great humility, God takes him into a moment of encounter. He takes uh, Peter, James, and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus reveals not only speaking plainly, but pro showing himself in a moment of encounter. That it's not just something Jesus just wants to, 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 to show him uh, by words. God's going to show him by deed. And he brings them into this moment of encounter. So sometimes it's a moment of encouragement. Sometimes it's a moment of rebuke. But it's all about growing more and knowing who Jesus is so that we may be obedient and be his leaders in this kingdom. 
See, to follow Jesus, we've got to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Uh, we don't know it for sure, but um, uh, there's a second century Christian by the name of Papias who tells us um, that, uh, that, that Mark was actually a scribe of Peter. We don't, this isn't gospel, we don't know this for sure, but according to Papias, that Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, who's writing all this down, was a scribe of Peter. So if so, Peter thinks it's really important that we hear this message of humility in our calling to follow Jesus, that we can't think we know better than God. We can't elevate our thoughts. We must hear Him and obey Him. If we zoom out one more step further in Peter's life, the end of Peter's life, um, will indeed be a martyr's death and he will be crucified and he'll say I'm not even worthy to die in the same manner as our Lord Jesus and so crucify me upside down the nth uh, degree of, of following Jesus to the cross I don't know where you're at in your life I don't know how this message is resonating with you but I know we're all called to deny ourselves take up our cross and follow Jesus I don't know what lofty opinions have risen up in you. I'm not sure kind of what your story is up to this point. I'm not sure where you're at with God's word. I want to encourage you. Befriend correction. Lean into the Lord. Don't think you know better. Re remember the gap is wide between his thoughts and our ways uh, and our thoughts. And, and so lean upon him. Trust his word and actually obey uh, his word. And, and I want to pray with you as we close out uh, today. God, I pray today, and I, and I just I reach out to you, Heavenly Father, um, on behalf of my brothers and sisters listening to this message. Uh, and I pray today first that you would forgive us for the moments and the times in which we think we know better. We think we've got it planned, and, and, and we know better, God. I, I pray that you would teach us through your word and through your spirit to just bring down our lofty opinions, the arguments that would set itself against the knowledge of you uh, within God, and I pray that you would teach us what it means to deny ourselves on a daily basis and, and then to take up our cross, whatever that might look like in our life, whatever suffering, whatever, whatever betrayal or rejection we may have to endure on this side of eternity. God, I pray that you would lead us deeper to follow you, that way we may live incredible lives of renown that, um, that would bring you glory and bring you honor. And we thank you for what you've done on the cross for us. Uh, to become the once and for all sacrifice for sin. And for that, we are grateful for the grace given to us. I pray that you be with my brothers and sisters as we live out this call in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.